Caitlin, it's Maddie from Do You Know, just quickly saying, hey, we're filming at Wildwood today and it is an amazing, magical place. You're so lucky to get to be here all the time. Hi. Hi, George. <laughs> so, yes. what are we here for today? Today I'm here to do some filming for my YouTube channel, uh, which is just my name, Maddie mm -hmm. Moat, um, in the bee zone. Um, my mum and I, we are both beekeepers. At home, we have one beehive, <laughs> but I found out that here you have 28 hives, and that is just, it's an environment and an atmosphere I would never be able to recreate at home. Mm. So it's a, it's a really special place for me to be able to come and film. It is, and, and bees are so important. We know they are, they pollinate, they do amazing things for uh, creating food for us. We wouldn't have it, but for nature, they're yeah. so important as well. And we lose so much of our diversity because we, we don't have many bees left. They're all dying, and mm -hmm. that's mostly due to factory farming, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and other reasons. But there's a reason why the bees are here. Yes. And that's because all around us, there's thousands of acres of woodland. One of the last places in England, so much woodlands in one place. And we're trying to rewild it, chop down all the, the nasty um, Corsican pines and western hemlocks, all the planted things, and recreate a true native woodland. And without the bees, that would be virtually impossible. Mm -hmm. So they all fly off into the woodlands. There's lots of heather in there as well. There's all kinds of different uh, plants that they pollinate, but they're helping recreate a natural woodland and they're a vital part mm -hmm. of that rewilding program we're trying to so do. So what sort of things are the bees here doing that are going to help with that repopulation? Well, when you try to create a rewilded habitat, it's not just about woodland per se. A rewilded habitat used to have large herbivores. So we're working with Kent Wildlife Trust to put in, we've already had some wild horses, these conic ponies we've got, and we've got bison about to go in there and wild boar. Mm. And at very low densities, just like it was a thousand, two thousand years ago, they create all the spaces mm -hmm. within the woodland. And in those spaces, you get all the rare wild uh, plants growing up. Mm. And you have what's called dwarf scrub. You have high woodland, dwarf scrub, and then you have some open, more grassy areas. And each one of them has lots of rare plants, the rarest plants that have nearly gone all extinct. Many things, we just don't understand what we've lost. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't understand what the wild habitat really was. And without bees, it isn't gonna be recreated. Mm -hmm. And that's bees ultra vital yeah. in that process. And that's mm -hmm. what we want to achieve here at Wildwood. And why we keep so many bees. So <laughs> if you're coming to Wildwood, make sure you pick up a jar of honey. I was gonna say, the honey they make is delicious, but also part of the reason it's so delicious is because they have such, well, an amazing range of native flowers to forage on. They so do. it's a really tasty, tasty honey. Cause it, they've it, got such a huge variety. Just looking around, you can see all the red. We've got the rose being well with herb and Profusion, that makes good honey. We've got heather around mm -hmm. here, all that stuff. It's just perfect. Well, I have to say, I think for the same reason as you, I first got into beekeeping because it was something that my mum did. She wanted to do her bit for the environment. Mm. I think she just wanted to, you know, know how, how can I help my, my own area, my own green spaces? And bees just felt, well, they just were. Um, were part of that you know mm. if you wanted to have a wildflower meadow and you wanted to help the other species that were living um, around about you know, her home that you needed bees to mm. to keep everything going but um, I got into it because I just found putting on a bee suit and just watching them almost quite I found it relaxing quite meditative I find them fascinating to watch I love finding things and looking mm. at stuff in close detail so for me bees really appealed but it's it's since doing that and since beekeeping that I've now come to realize how important they are to our ecosystems and how important of a role they play within our ecosystems that's what's kept me interested mm -hmm. and it's why now I want people to fall in love with them as much as I have. So as somebody on the front line of teaching our children yes good science and facts I try. what do you think what do you think is the key to getting through to the next generation? The key to what about about bees or just Learning about, about everything that's important mm. life science and I'm I don't I actually feel really positive about the next generation whenever I speak to children or even young teenagers they have a better grasp of what's going on with our environment and our climate and the changes that need to happen they have they have a better grasp on it than so many adults so I feel really positive I think I talk to a much younger audience and I see my role as just 
um, spreading positivity and a message of curiosity and joy. I don't feel the need to be telling children why things are going wrong mm. or how things could go terribly wrong. I want young people to know why the likes of bees are fascinating, why it's important to look at our ecosystems as a whole and to see how interesting it is that everything's connected because I honestly think that it's that joy and passion that will grow into activism and good behaviours and good habits in the future. So it's something we share this idea of showing the natural world mm. to people and opening their eyes to its beauty and wonder. Yeah. There's something you were saying though about mm. rewilding and the idea of everything being connected. I think that's a really important message to spread because it's very easy to talk about uh, a species in trouble like the bee and go, oh, you know, save the bee, they're in trouble. But it's hard to understand how that's directly relevant to us. Perhaps a bee isn't a good example because I think we all understand that without bees we wouldn't be able to eat. Mm. Um, but if you look at perhaps other species that you don't know so well or you might not have in your back garden, it's hard to understand. All I, well, I get that it's sad that they're they're declining, but it's not really relevant to me. But I think if you can explain how everything works together as a system and how without this you don't have that and without that you won't have this mm. I think that helps make things relevant to young people and that's really necessary if you want them to care about it they need to know how it impacts them mm. I, I agree entirely it's a, I'm, I'm a slightly autistic and always have been a nerdy chap and many of the people who are worried about the environment Greta Thunberg and and Chris Packham they're all of a similar but we kind of see the world to me is I see all the complex relationships the, the thousands of organisms in a tree over spanning hundreds of years to me I was taught by my granddad and I really learned about wildlife and to me it's totally relevant every time we damage one species mm -hmm. that takes away another for more species and you can see it, it you know the world is, is collapsing the, the number of insects is collapsing mm -hmm. the, the carbon released from soils and understanding the, mm -hmm. the, how soils work we're destroying the, how the functionality of soils mm -hmm. and it's all to me very relevant and I, I, I so wish that the people who make money from destroying the world and the politicians would understand it but I don't think they ever will the mm -hmm. only way we are going to solve the problem is through education and we create a new reality where everybody understands about nature and then they will tackle the problem at the present our whole systems are never going to tackle the problems yeah. because they don't realize what they're doing mm -hmm. yeah i completely agree thank you so much for you're coming. so well thank you for having me this is an absolute delight i couldn't ask for a better set to be honest to film in so i'm made up it? i'm thrilled yeah it is amazing what uh, uh, our apiarist John the Bee has done. He's yeah. created a beautiful environment here. And many of the visitors don't see the, the off sea scenes where we're doing our work, but yeah. there's many off scenes around wildlife where we're, mm. we've, we're breeding animals and we're doing things. And yeah. it's so lovely to come around. And even I'm not allowed here now and again. I'm stung. <laughs> but it is gorgeous, isn't they it? They all seem very calm. And actually, you say getting stung, that's what I'm making a video about today, mm -hmm. talking about education um, and wanting to spread, you know, a love and a joy of bees. Something that holds people back, I think, from mm. loving them is a fear, is a fear of getting stung, which is completely natural because if you do get stung, it does hurt. Mm. But, um, Today, with the help of John and all of the, or the million bees that might be living here right now, I'm trying to help explain that bees don't want, or honeybees don't want to sting you, no. and there's a very, very good reason for it. So we don't want to, we don't need to fear them. It's far more dangerous. It's more dangerous having a shower this morning <laughs> than ever a bee. Yeah. Even if we reintroduce wolves and bears, people say it's mm. they fear mm. wolves and bears. Do you know if we reintroduced wolves, we'd actually have less deaths? Eh? Now, I used to do well, mad statistician and computer mm -hmm. model, and I used to do stuff for Scottish Wildlife Trust. And if you look at how many road accidents there are with deer, red deer, and you look at wolves controlling that population, so wolves might kill one person every 50 years, right? The statistics, if you go on and goes on Europe, probably once every 150 years. About 180 people die every year due to road accidents because of deer in Scotland. Well, okay. It's insane, isn't it? Yeah. 
and you would cut that by more than half. Mm. So when we look at real science, when we get into the science of, of fear of animals, it, it's rubbish. It, it, it isn't there. It's, it's just an innate fear. And we have to use our, our learned minds to get over those fears, mm. to realise that there are many people in Europe living with wolves and bears. Wolves and bears do fantastic things to ecology. They, they help the trees grow. You know, they say the, the, um, the deer um, lives in mortal fear of the wolf, but the mountain lives in mortal fear of the deer. Mm. And uh, that's, that's that wonderful, the, um, um, I'll remember his name in a minute, mm. chap who said that many moons ago, but it's right. Because once you remove the wolf or the bear, the deer get too many and they eat out mm. all the trees and then there's nothing left and the, the, the erosion starts happening and all the soil disappears and mm. literally it will erode a mountain over time and and so learning the mm. deep deep things about nature yeah. and i know that's far beyond little children but i do hope that the share and wonder that you create and so many children including my daughter will allow them to then go on and understand just how wonderful this planet is and how it can be saved quite easily mm -hmm. just by stop being so stupid and <laughs> using land inefficiently and farming inefficiently and all these kind of things we can feed ourselves we can have amazing habitats we can have no poverty we just have to stop people being selfish and stupid if only it was that simple no, <laughs> thank you so much thank you